Welcome to Module 3. This lecture introduces the three steps that make up the content assessment phase of a content strategy development project. I'll start by introducing the overall assessment process and then talk about the three steps. Uh, describing the content inventory, then the quantitative audit, finally the qualitative audit. There's a lot of information with a good level of detail here, so let's go. In the last module, we focused on the planning phase of discovery when developing a content strategy. At this point, the content strategy development team is ready to begin assessing the content. I think it's worth thinking about the fact that traditional publishers, of course, kept careful records of their content. After all, content in the form of books or magazines or whatever are the product that those businesses sell. Non-traditional publishers, on the other hand, tend to amass quite a collection of content assets without any comprehensive record of them. It's not that surprising, of course, because in those businesses, content was rarely treated as an asset, especially from the beginning. For a long time, businesses just kept publishing more and more content on the web and abandoning an old website to create a new one without ever cleaning up what was already there. In 2019, HubSpot wrote an article titled, Why We Removed 3,000 Pieces of Outdated Content from the HubSpot Blog. It turns out that SEO, search engine optimization, requires what HubSpot called content pruning. How would you determine what to do, what to get rid of? Well, you need to start by assessing the content you have. The very first step in assessing content is to conduct an inventory. You need an organized list of every content asset along with whatever details you have about each of those assets. Who owns it? When was it last updated? More about that in a minute. The inventory is purely descriptive. The second step is to conduct a quantitative audit of the inventoried assets. Starting with the content inventory, you'll want to add quantitative performance metrics like how many times a web page has been viewed or how many assets there are in different categories, like how many blog posts. The third step is to conduct a qualitative audit of those same assets. This step adds qualitative performance metrics, things like how well does a page meet users' needs or how important is that asset given current business priorities. The second and third steps are evaluative rather than simply descriptive. Before I talk about the details of each of these steps, let's listen to Colleen Jones, CEO at Content Science, talk about how her consultancy assessed content for one of their clients. You invite the voice of the customer, you um, let the customer be heard. Could you tell us a little bit about the different ways in which you have done that? Yeah, absolutely. So. It's really exciting that it's easier than ever to get feedback from people about content. And I've used all kinds of different ways uh, to do that. In addition to what we just talked about with surveys and polls, uh, which are great for getting you know quantitative levels of data that reflect people's perceptions and perspectives. Um, I also am a big fan of interviews and usability style testing, but focused on content. And those are great for digging in depth into why people are doing what they're doing, why they're confused, why they're having a problem, why they love something, <laughs> if that's not obvious. Um, it's also great for using those kinds of methods for trying out something new. Uh, you know, if you're taking a very different approach to content, it's, it's good to test that out, get some feedback first before committing and investing all the time, money, resources into that very different approach. So we often do that in tandem with vision strategy. Let's develop a concept and, and test it out and get some feedback. Um, 
And those interviews, they can be done in a variety of ways. They can be done in person. They can be done remotely. Uh, you can do just a small number if you really need to, to get some directional feedback and just get a little bit more into why. Um, you can do them at a little bit larger scale if you need to really validate and confirm uh, a direction before you launch or before you go, you know, whole hog on it. So um, those are, are great points of, of data. Also, uh, a lot of support uh, happens over social media these days. And there are great tools out there that can quickly analyze and assess things like the sentiment about your company, your product, your content on social media, uh, and would definitely take advantage of those when it makes sense, when there is enough, you know, commentary on social media to, to get something useful in terms of insight. Okay, so now let's move into some details about creating an inventory. Part two, I'll show you one way and describe some of the most important aspects of this step. Let's start with what's the goal of a content inventory. Enterprise Content Strategy, the book, defines the goal of an inventory as to determine what content and how much of it a business has. Basically, there's no way to be strategic about your content without knowing what you have. So the first step is to inventory those assets. I'm showing you how you can begin a content inventory for a website. I'm using the UNT Techcom website as an example, because I have access. I'm using a tool called Screaming Frog Spider. There's a free version. That's the one I'm using. Sometimes this type of tool is called a content analysis tool or CAT, CAT. I'm showing you how this works in real time with this actual URL. Feel free to skip it if you're not interested. I wanted you to see that with the free version of this software, you are limited in the number of URLs or files that Screaming Frog Spider will locate for you. Once its results are 100% complete, you have the option to export into an Excel file. At the end of the process, I have an Excel file with these details. You should know Excel is probably the default tool for documenting an inventory. If you're a novice and you need some definitions of what all these things mean in the spreadsheet, I encourage you to visit Screaming Frog's user guide as definitions for everything. So not every detail is going to be automatically created by a spidering tool. You'll have to add some information manually. At a minimum, you're going to want to assign an ID number. Think about it. If content is a valuable asset, every content asset should have a unique number that can be used by everyone to manage it throughout its life cycle within the business. You should capture which business unit owns a piece of content and the author, if you can. It'll be helpful to enter the type of content, like news item, blog post, biography, and also important dates, like the date of initial publication or of the last update. If you have content in multiple languages, then entering the language of each asset would be critical. 
There are many more possibilities. It may be useful to capture the target audience and channel for each content asset. Your decisions about details should be driven by your goals and the amount of time you can afford to spend collecting information. Although the assumption is that an inventory is comprehensive, in other words, it's a record of all assets, your project team might have good reasons to limit the scope of the content you're going to inventory. In a large organization, it might not make sense to inventory every asset, especially if the goal of developing a content strategy doesn't require it. Some experts suggest starting small, even if your goals are broad. So will you restrict the inventory to a single microsite at the business, or will you sample from all landing pages across the entire business website? Ultimately, the decision should be driven by the goals for developing a content strategy that you and the team agreed upon in the planning stage. In Content Strategy for the Web, Halverson and her co-author provide these tips to help you determine how to choose a sample. Let me give you a couple of examples. If you're focused on an entire organizational website, but 70% of the site is devoted to sales-focused content, then 70% of your sample should be made up of that content. Or, if a certain user group is the priority given current business objectives, then make sure much of your sample is content that was written or created for that group of users. You could think about things like traffic, content ownership, update frequency, click depth, in the same ways to ensure the sample of content in your inventory represents what's critical about developing your content strategy at this point in time. So when you're done with the first step in assessing content, the team has the descriptive details they need about relevant content assets. In the second step, the team begins evaluating rather than simply describing those same assets. So in part three of the lecture, we'll begin thinking through the quantitative data related to content performance. So what type of quantitative performance data might be available to help you evaluate content? Colleen Jones summarizes these measures as reach, engagement, and conversion. Let me briefly show you a couple of examples. In the first instance, I'm showing you the default stats available from within the content management system, or CMS, called WordPress for my own blog, ProseWrite. From the status table, you'll see a bar graph that you can filter by day or by year. When you scroll down, you'll see blocks with specifics about the main content, posts and pages in this case. You see the number of page views. These numbers can be added to the spreadsheet in which you've built your content inventory. They give you an idea about the relative popularity of posts or pages on the site. If you click on a specific post here, you'll see even more details. Now, page views are a measure of what most marketers call reach. That's a measure of the number of individuals exposed to content at least once. Counting file downloads might also be a measure of reach. WordPress stats also include a table called insights with aggregated counts meant to help you assess both reach and what marketers call engagement. See the number of likes, comments, and follower totals? These could also be added to a spreadsheet for the content assets. All right, in the second example, I'm showing you the stats available for free from within Google Analytics for the TechCom department website. Uh, we're looking at data over most of 2020. Because of our interest in content, I'll concentrate on the behavior tab, which quantifies what users of the website did. Let's go to site content and look at all pages on the site. In the table, you see one page in each row and then several columns with measures for reach and engagement for that row or content asset. There's page views again. And because page view counts uh, multiple visits to the same page within a single user session, there's also a column for unique page views in which the page would count only once per user session. Average time on page is a measure of engagement. In other words, the longer a user stays on a page, the more likely they are engaged with the content of that page. On the other hand, bounce rate is a measure of poor engagement. When a user arrives on a page and clicks out immediately, 
They're obviously not engaged with the content. Within a for-profit business, measures of conversion are also very important as a quantitative indicator of performance. Here we see a column headed page value, which might provide that type of information for a website if it was set up the right way. That's not true of the TechCom department page. Google Analytics also lets you see paths, the paths that users took from one page to the next. This can be incredibly useful information. Conversion metrics like adding an item to a shopping cart or requesting information are probably easier to understand. Another possible conversion measure could be contacting support via chat or email. Businesses might also have customer satisfaction data that can be tied directly to an asset. Any of these quantitative metrics can be added to the spreadsheet in which you did the inventory, right? In order to capture as much detail as possible about each relevant piece of content during your development project. Google Analytics is incredibly powerful and constantly evolving. Anybody doing content strategy involving web publication should certainly know at least a little bit about these quantitative measures of reach and engagement. Using quantitative evidence about content performance has definite advantages, like numbers can be aggregated and analyzed easily to draw conclusions that are more generalizable. If nine of 10 people like the beer on the left best, that provides some persuasive evidence of its appeal. However, those numbers don't tell us why people liked it better. Maybe that beer's earthy and pungent. But if I like brilliant and zippy, those numbers don't tell me anything of value about the beer. I need to know their qualities. In the same way, content strategy development teams are best served when they have both quantitative and qualitative evaluations of content performance. At the conclusion of the second stage, the team has evaluated content assets using quantitative metrics and now needs to evaluate qualitative data. In part three, I'm gonna present you with five qualities that are typically important when assessing business content. The first quality of content performance I'm gonna describe is called findability. Moz, one of the first SEO consultancies, defines content as findable when its intended user can successfully locate it. Most SEO efforts are focused on external findability. In other words, whether a business appears in the search results on a place like Google when users search for content that that business has actually put on the web somewhere. But findable business content should obviously appear on internal SERPs, search engine results pages, SERPs, when users search for content too. Findability is directly tied to things like keywords, and metadata. We'll talk more about those a little later. When the content strategy development team is assessing the findability of a content asset, they're going to need to investigate what users have searched for and when they appear to have found what they wanted. In some cases, you may find that users reach out to customer support for a specific issue with no evidence of visiting a content asset that exists already in an online knowledge base or even that there is no existing content that explains that issue. In the first situation, the team would have evidence to support rating the content asset with low or unacceptable findability. They target that content asset for revision to make it more findable. In the second situation, the content just needs to be created or acquired. In both cases, the team members act like detectives, looking at what evidence of user behavior they have to uncover content performance issues. It might be helpful to share this quote from The Content Advantage, Colleen Jones' book, Clout 2.0. She argues that content strategy is more like poker than chess because poker players have to strategize with only partial information available to them. That's going to be your role as a content strategist as well. The assumption is that content consumers need content to actually do something. So the second quality of content performance I'll describe is called usability. Nielsen Norman Group describes usable design or content as learnable. How easy is it for users to accomplish basic tasks the first time they encounter a design? Efficient. 
once users have learned the design, how quickly can they actually do a task? Memorable. So when users return to the design or the content after a period of not using it, how easily can they reestablish their proficiency? Error reducing. How many errors do users make? How severe are they? How easily can they recover from them? And finally, satisfaction promoting. How pleasant is it to use the content? Measures of usability include things like success rate, whether users can perform a task at all. Um, also, the time it takes to complete the task, uh, the error rate, user satisfaction level. The third quality of content performance I'll mention is accuracy. If a content asset is findable and usable, but it's inaccurate, it's of little value. Users who find one inaccurate content asset are likely to lose trust in the accuracy of others. Content doesn't remain accurate forever. The older an asset is, the more likely it's out of date. Unless a business governs all content assets through a life cycle of regular review, it's unlikely to ever remove outdated content. If a company's had a major change, say moving headquarters, then everyone on the content strategy development team should be able to judge whether the address for headquarters in a specific asset is accurate. However, that won't be the case for every asset. Sometimes you'll have to depend on customer feedback to locate issues, or you'll need stakeholders who own the content asset to judge its accuracy. The fourth quality of content performance I'll describe is brand voice. Kate Moran, one of the UX professionals working at Nielsen Norman Group, said brand voice communicates how an organization feels about its message. It's commonplace for consumers to compare the voices of competitors like, for example, Coca-Cola versus Pepsi or Microsoft versus Apple. When the content strategy development team is assessing brand voice, they need to see how well a specific content asset follows the chosen voice of the business. Large companies will have interrelated guides designed to communicate a consistent image of their brand. Things like a brand guide that might include how the company name should and shouldn't be used. A design guide, for example, about what colors are to be used in different message channels. Uh, a content guide about what verbal tone should be used. A style guide about what spelling should be used when there are alternates. Depending upon the format of the content asset that is in your spreadsheet, any of these guides may contain relevant guidance for the team to use. You may find that some assets in a product catalog do not follow content guidance about writing to readers in a friendly tone, for example. Then the rating for brand voice might be captured in your spreadsheet as needs improvement. The fifth and final quality of content performance I'll describe is KPI support. Let me take a few minutes to teach you the basics of KPIs. KPI, which stands for Key Performance Indicator, is a very common means of performance management in large companies. I'm gonna explain a few KPI concepts with a very simple example. Let's say you currently weigh 200 pounds but have a goal to weigh 175. Then 175 pounds is your target performance. Your current weight is what we call a lagging performance indicator. It's the result of what you've done in the past, but it doesn't help you manage what you do going forward. Instead, you need what's called a leading performance indicator, like uh, how about the number of steps you walk or the number of calories you consume each day. If you decide these two performance indicators are the key to reaching your target, they become your key performance indicators or KPIs. You track them as a way to make sure you're heading toward your target. So, of course, we are all familiar with smartphone apps that are designed to help you track the current values of those KPIs in the same way that the gauges help the pilot track performance of their aircraft. The smartphone apps also usually help you track performance over time. Businesses develop their KPIs to help them reach targets. The managers of their functional units doesn't matter whether it's marketing or engineering. They search for leading KPIs that can track what they're doing inside their own units that can be used to show they're helping the business reach its targets. They often use software that provides a dashboard showing current KPI values as well as their history and target. So 
what does the content strategy team need to know about KPIs and why am I talking about quantitative measures during the lecture on qualitative audits? While KPIs themselves are measured with numbers, the content strategy team is interested in their relationship to specific content assets. Assigning a piece of content to one or more KPIs is a qualitative judgment. We return to our simple example. If you find your step and calorie counts are influenced by whether your smartphone app sends you a notification at 7 a.m., that notification content can then be tied to your weight loss target and rated as high in the KPI support category. As a reminder, I've mentioned several common KPIs used by marketing professionals to talk about web content. I showed you how quantitative audits can uncover measures of reach, engagement, and conversion. I did that in a CMS like WordPress and with Google Analytics. The bottom line about KPIs is that content strategy development teams should have learned about these when they were listening to stakeholders at the beginning of the assessment phase. Your qualitative audit should tie pieces of content to KPIs whenever that's possible. Think about it. If a content asset isn't tied to any KPIs, it might not have any business value. We'll talk more about what to do in cases like that a little later. Before I move on from this discussion of KPIs, it's worth showing you this graphic again that came from the Content Strategy ROI chapter in Bailey and Urbina's book. It's my way of reminding you, a content inventory and audit will only be valuable if their results can be used to make a business more profitable. How can the details and the data that you're collecting be used to make more or spend less money in that business? The project team must continuously and explicitly connect back to the value of existing content to build brand loyalty, increase revenue, manage risk, increase efficiency, um, changing scope. Regardless of the care with which you produce your inventory and audit, if you're not making these connections, your content strategy work will ultimately fail. Let me summarize what I've covered about content qualities that can be assessed during a qualitative content audit. I've mentioned three what we could call best practices qualities to use. Findability, you might use in your spreadsheet a three-level descriptive scale. Uh, you'll choose needs improvement for one piece of content and excellent or acceptable for another. For usability, you could do the same kind of scale or you could use a number scale, one to five, one meaning um, it's not usable and five meaning it's stupendously usable. I've also covered two strategic qualities to use during qualitative content audit, brand voice and business value. With brand voice, you probably would um, use a category, something like the ones above, either the three excellent acceptable needs improvement or some kind of a number scale. But with the business value, what you might wanna do is pick from a predefined list of KPIs. So in your spreadsheet, you would have a row with a content asset, and then you would have a list of KPIs, and one of those, you hope, you would be able to assign to that specific asset. The one remaining item I should mention is that judges play a critical role in all qualitative content audits. People, ultimately, are the measuring stick. They're the ones categorizing assets. Using the standards and definitions set up by the content strategy development team, the team is supposed to represent a range of stakeholders within the business, so hopefully their judgments represent those of the stakeholders they're supposed to represent. If the team has time and money, they can certainly set up interviews or surveys with stakeholders that aren't on the team to get their judgments. They could even conduct usability or A-B tests with representative users or with representative messages. It should be becoming more and more obvious that the content strategy development team needs to interact with many people to do a good job in the discovery stage of their project. At the conclusion of the qualitative content audit, the team has pretty much completed their work in assessing content assets, what Bailey calls the discovery phase of content strategy development. Although I've talked about these phases separately, it is sometimes possible to do some of the, the individual things concurrently. 
In Module 4, we'll begin considering how you use all this information to define the gap. Do a gap analysis between where a business wants to be and where they are now based on your analysis of what you've learned during discovery.